Hello, guys. Welcome to the show. Welcome, 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 everyone. Welcome, Alessandra Nicholson from the Condre Institute, and welcome, Mala Roberts, Prep Accreditation Readiness. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining. We'll go into uh, our intro, and we'll be right back. Welcome, guys. Welcome to the show. I'd like to introduce my special guest, Mala Roberts, MHA, BSE, RNIP. Um, she's a healthcare executive helping hospitals and ASCs comply with the regulatory compliance, new builds, or SPD remodels, policy review, competency review, and decreased risk of Sentinel instrument, um, Sentinel <laughs> events. Uh, welcome, Mala. How are you? How are you tonight? You. I'm Thanks. good. How are you? You'll have to excuse the hoarse voice. I've had pneumonia, but I'm better. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for having me on the show today. You are welcome. You are welcome. And let's get right into it. Alessandra, my co-host, is experiencing a few difficulties. She will be on shortly. Um, so let's get right into the, the nitty-gritty. So we posted... Um, a little question online about um, implants and should they be uh, decontamined before sterilization? So, what's your take on that? I know everyone, every people weighed in. They said um, we should. Some didn't know, and some people don't do it. So, what's your take? Uh, what what issues um, not doing it will create? Um, not washing your um, putting your implants through the wash cycle before use what issues would that cause and um what 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 is um the what other regulatory agencies looking for in terms of that okay well the question was, that was posed you know was um basically where should the vendors restock their trays and a lot of people have them coming into decontamination a lot of people let them come into prep and pack and you know open their things in there but when we across the country and where we go, what we typically see is another room set up outside of that and it's a vendor room. It's for them to pick up, to restock and to drop off. And that's where they log their trays, they weigh their trays, you know, and then that's your paper trail as to what's going on, what they're leaving a device for if there isn't anyone from SPD there to meet them. And you have to understand there are lots of 24 seven SPDs out there, but then there are some that just work, you know, a 10, 12 hour day and they're, they're closed during the night. So for those smaller facilities, sometimes that's hard. You know, that's one reason why the lockdown is good. You know, if you have after hour um, cases and it's when it comes to joint commission and CMS, they look, it, it depends on who you get for your surveyor because the, standards are so to me they're just they're opinionated it's how whatever the surveyor uh thinks when how how they they are perceiving that that um infection control or environment of care standard should be um discussed or how it should be cited most of the time though and what we try to do when we look at at, at building or remodeling sterile processing room is completely getting your vendors out of your sterile processing area and if you've ever had to replace a $150,000 um, universal screw removal tray, you will, <laughs> you will not want them in your prep and pack area because it's so easy for, the, for vendors to walk off with things and then you have to go back and repurchase it. So we always, from a financial standpoint, look at that. But from the infection control standpoint, and I saw a picture on LinkedIn today of a vendor saying, hey, I delivered um, implants you see um, on Thanksgiving Day and it looked cloudy. He had them all in the back of his truck along with his um, turkey fryer and everything else. But that's how they were going to a facility. So we need to kind of watch vendors. Um, when we talk about them restocking the trays, 
the, they should go through the wash and decontam, but then they should be put back into the vendor room. And in that vendor room was where they would come in to restock it. Then it would go back through the wash and then over to prep and pack. What we see happening a lot are things are coming um, through the washer. They're allowed into prep and pack. Um, number one, some of them aren't following the surgical attire policy, you know, or changing, doing anything any differently to keep that area clean like it should be. And then number two, they're bringing in their their own things from outside, which is a big no-no, especially to the OR area. So it should be to the prep and pack sterile area as well. They bring these things in that have dust on them. They're stored in their garages. Some of these implants are stored in storage buildings that they've rented. Um, most mm-hmm. of these companies like Synthes and Stryker and, um, oh, the list goes on, their vendors are responsible for their own uh, stock. So they get all this stock. Well, they have to pay for somewhere to, to put it. So it's either in their garage or it's in, a, you know, a locked storage unit somewhere. Um, and the problem True. with that is, you know, the spiders, the dust, the, you know, and I've had people say, but they come in and they're in closed plastic containers. Well, they're still dusty and dirty and you're bringing all that outside stuff into your prep and pack area, which is supposed to be just as sterile in there as your OR room. Um, not, not exactly sterile, but very, very clean because things from there are going to go into the autoclave and a lot of places, once it goes through the autoclave, it comes right back through prep and pack because they don't have the other side to open it up and store it on that side. So when you look at those things, that's one of the things that, that um, you, you hardly ever see that cited by joint commission because there aren't a lot of, or CMS. Fortunately, there are not a lot of surveyors that have extensive um, an, a background in sterile processing so they know what questions to ask and you're only out of luck if you get somebody who really knows what they're talking about the sad thing is some of these people that do not know about a, a bunch about you know sterile processing you're going to get written up for tiny things that you you overlook because you think they're not going to be looking at that so when people freak out over their documentation and how they're doing you know their tracking of instrumentation and things like that that's not something that's usually on a a surveyor's radar environment of care and infection control are going to be the number one things on their radar because most of them do not know how to read an autoclave they don't know what the maximum and the minimum is or how long it's supposed to stay in there. You know, they they will say, let's let me look at your documents. But a lot of them have admitted that they can't even read them. So um, I'm very frustrated with that because I've been into so many places that that I would probably close down if I were a joint commissioner CMS surveyor. And so you don't want me out there doing that because I could come to your hospital. <laughs> true, true. Um, the other thing that we wanted to talk about um with vendors is that, you know, just having the control over them and making sure you have so many, um, and and I'm writing an article right now about, um, we talk about nurse bullying and, you know, all the time throughout the thing, but a lot, a lot of what I see is physician bullying. We have a lot of that going on and they, they stand up and they take care of those vendors and, you know, people feel afraid to step up and talk to those vendors and say, I need you to put on this cap or I need you to put this mask on, you know, because they're notorious for running to the surgeon and complaining. And then the surgeon goes to the OR director and says, these people are being mean to my vendor, you know, so we know all of those things that happen, but you still have to, you know, dig your feet in the mud, document everything and stand up for yourself. Um, And and that's just, you know, so when, when people want to know, you know, where's the correct place for putting together your and restocking your vendor trays. There is not one solid answer that Amy, AORN, CMS, or Joint Commission gives you. Mm -hmm. So you have to think infection control. And so when you're thinking about that, that's why I always stand with they should have their own separate area. It's just like um, CMS uh, and the Joint Commission are citing people now for having the pegboards over in prep and pack area because you can't clean the pegboards. You can't get in every little hole and they get dust in them. And then you see people just pulling it off and adding it to a set without it going through the wash first. 
And so the same thing, if you have that mentality about vendor trays or vendor implants coming in, you're bringing something that's dirty or contaminated into your prep and pack side and letting you're allowing an outsider to come into that area and put trays together. And then those trays a lot of times are wrapped and they go straight into the autoclave without washing those instruments or anything. So infection control should always be the first thing on your mind when you're when you're in um the OR perioperative area. So the other thing that I, you know, I told Alessandra that I would talk about is the top CMS and um, joint commission citations that we've seen over the past year and across the country, because a lot of people want to know, what am I looking at? What am I looking for? What is the surveyor looking for? And um, so I put together, you know, like the top five things that we've seen that really haven't, they're just not changing. And so, the number one thing, of course, and it's always a finding for an immediate jeopardy, which means they can shut you down and say, stop your surgeries, stop everything until CMS comes in and, you know, lets you kick back up again. And that is your environment of care, doing something in a positive um, environment that should be negative. So if your um, prep and pack area is negative, then you're in trouble. So, and if your decontamination area is positive, then you're in trouble because it should be the opposite. So uh, it's the same if they go to an operating room that's they're always positive and they read it and it's negative, they will completely go to administration and say, we're finding this as an immediate jeopardy and we need to shut this down. So the same thing happened in, in um, Detroit, Michigan uh, last year. And one thing that I, I tell sterile processing managers, OR leaders, everything, when things like this are happening, document, 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 and always cover yourself because has that end up, ended up, the administration lied and said that they didn't know anything about it. No one had reported anything to them, but they did ha report it. They did do their due diligence, have their documentation. CMS came back and let them keep their, their um, ability to bill for Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, and they're standing with them as long as, but the, the stipulation was the C-suite had to go. So your CNO, your COO, and your CEO were forced out of the facility. And it was because they had been, they had been notified by sterile processing in the OR that there were things that were not working properly and no, and no one fixed them. So that's the first thing. So a lot of people aren't on a central alarm. If you are on a central alarm and it's in the middle of the night, who's notified? What do you do about it? How long are things allowed to stay closed without, you know, you, you deciding that these all have to be reran because they're contaminated? So there is a good universal policy um, out there that will will guide you to tell you that after so long, um, this is when, you know, th these are the steps that we take. And if anybody wants that universal policy, if you'll just on my LinkedIn, if you will send me a private message with your email address, I'll be happy to send that to you. Um, it really does help lead you because I've gone into facilities that have been closed for six months and they want to reopen them. And the people walked out with everything sterile in there. And the, the people that wanted to reopen it thought it's fine. We can just reopen it. And it's not because temperature, humidity, pressure, none of that had been monitored during that six months of being closed. So millions of dollars got thrown in the trash because of that. So that's the first thing. And then, you know, they're going to look at your documentation. Uh, are you doing it daily? And if it's out of range, what did you do about it? How long was it down? You know, and then again, like I said, this policy will help guide you with that. Um, so that will be your environment, a care surveyor that can cite you for that, or it can be the person do, just doing your regular sterile processing um, rounding. The second a, thing that we see, you know, oh, I have a question. Sorry, um, how do you know what surveyor is specialized in which service or which um, area of expertise? How do you know what well, they're looking can, for? Yes, ask them. <laughs> you can, yes, you can ask. Well, the thing that most people don't know is that when CMS gets there, their first hour that they're there that morning, they're meeting with administration and they're talking to them about, you know, what are your concerns, you know, things like that, telling them what they need. And then they have policies and competencies, you know, things like that. And the, the rules and medical staff rules and regulations, their credentialing files, 
all of that, there's a whole list of things that we ask for when we walk in the door. So we look at those things before going to a department. So that you have plenty of time for them to tell you who's come, you know, who it is. Even your quality person knows when they're coming, when they come that morning, they will automatically get their uh, biography. They could very easily pass this along from department to department. So you know who you're getting. Most of the time, it's sad to say you have a physician that will tour SPD. The last hospital I was in during a survey because they were coming back for a resurvey and we had done their plan of corrections for CMS, they sent a physician in to tour the, uh, the operating room and sterile processing. Well, all they knew was it was a physician. He was a dentist. He had no idea about what went on in surgery. And, you know, so you can find out who's coming to your department before they get there. And then you'll know pretty much if they know anything or if they don't, you know, and it's always mm. good not to say anything and just answer questions. So, so, so big thing in the cell processing world. What if your surveyor, surveyor is incorrect in making a determination on a violation you may or may not have? What, what, the, what would be the best course of action? Should you address it on the spot? Should you wait till the later afternoon meeting, which we all know we have that, that meeting to know what, <laughs> what you got cited for or which department okay. did the best. So when would you address that? Well, without being argumentative, because that's number one, you know, um, if you offend a surveyor, they are typically going to just spot you for it. And that's the end of it. And, and even when it goes to the correction phase, I've seen them get so angry that even though they knew it was true, they still cited right. them for it just to make them do a plan of correction. So one thing that you can do is if they ask you a question, you answer it and they disagree with you. Um, you might ask them back, why, you know, why do you disagree with me? You know, and if you have something that can back you up like an Amy standard right there available, you know, that's fine. And if not, just nod your head and say, OK, you know, I understand. But the sterile processing manager has to be very careful if she's not if she is under the. Um, the leadership of like an OR director. So in some cases you have an SPD director and they, they are not under anyone other than, you know, maybe the VP of surgery who sometimes is off site and doing two or three hospitals at one time. But I would, I would always take that higher. If you're a tech that's answering that question, I would say, okay, um, well, thank you. You know, thank you for, you know, your opinion or thank you for whatever. But I always ask first why you think that, you know, because I was taught by Amy standard. Now they need to be able to quote the standard or be able to show it. And so when it comes back to those things at the end, if you were cited for it and you need to go back and prove it, then you need to have documentation to prove that. So whether it's um, from Amy, AORN or your own policy, a lot of times people write their policies and they're not following AORN or Amy standards. This is a, um, a two edged sword there. If you write your own policy and you follow part of AORN standards, but not all of them, but mm -hmm. your pol you have another policy that says you will follow AORN standards in your department. Well, that one trumps it. So that's the first thing. If we come in and look at policies, that was one thing on here that I wanted to talk to you about, too, because some people back themselves against the wall. Number one, not having policies or number two, making them so specific that your staff can't follow them. So. Um, I wouldn't be argumentative. I would answer, you know, I would ask them, you know, to explain to you, you know, what their, what their view of it is, you know, and then you can go away and explain that to your leader or look up what you need to carry for you for documentation to that, that follow-up meeting where you get to plead your case. <laughs> All right. So not to go off, off, um, off topic, but in terms of policies, now I've I've seen many different types of policies. So I've heard uh, from persons writing policies, from different persons who write policies on a regular basis. So I've seen some policies that are very very specific, almost like a competency, and I have some policies that are almost like a SOP um, that do not say exactly what product or how long the step is, but say hey you do this and use this, and then you'll it'll be you'll end the process. So what would be the best one? A more detailed um, 
policy or a policy that's a little vague in terms of exactly what you use because products, times, temperatures change over a period of time. So which one would be the best? Right. And that's that's what I always tell everyone. If you're writing a policy, number one, be vague. Uh, number two, never put the name of the machine you're using. Um, you might decide to trade that out. You know, if you're in endoscopy, you know, say, and you have a metavator, suppose your metavators go down or your hospital gets a better deal with Olympus and you're remodeling, you decide to go to Olympus. But when that happens, all of those policies have to be changed. So you should use like an automated endoscopic reprocessor, you know, AER, instead of talking mm -hmm. about, you know, the name of it. So that's what you asked. I mean, that's the answer to one of your questions is be vague about, you know, list what type of what type it is, but not the brand name of it. And then the second mm -hmm. thing we hate, I hate to see anybody put down, this is how you do it step by step, because that will get you in trouble every single time. And you can always say, we follow the manufacturer's instructions for use. So on everything that you do, and then you have to prove that you have the IFUs, which that really isn't a problem because most, most people now across the country have one source and it is tied into uh, a lot of the instrument tracking um, modules that are out there right now that people are, are getting. And so that's going to be one of the main things, you know, coming up on every instrument is tracked back. But, you know, this is not always something that's um, financially okay for a lot of, a lot of places to do. Sure. So we want to make sure we don't back ourselves up against the wall. I had a place in Boston last year that was written up because um, they put in there specifically how to do high level disinfection. And the person, they didn't have anything in there to put through the SIDEX. But when the person walked them through their steps, the tech actually forgot one of the steps. Not that she wouldn't have done it because she was faking doing the step, but they were written mm -hmm. up for that. And so, I mean, things like that to me are crazy because it's hard to do things from memory. But when you put it in a policy that you'll soak it for so many minutes, if you're mm -hmm. putting in your policy that you'll soak your instruments in your sink under a, with an enzymatic for five minutes and we look around and we don't see a timer or anything in there, that's that's going to be one of those things that we say, how long do you soak your instruments while they're in here? And when you say five minutes, well, how do you know it's been five minutes? So, and that's always sure. you get that deer in a headlight look, you know, from your tech. And and I always feel bad about them. But you know, remember, we get to see a lot of these policies right before we come. If I know that I'm going to sterile processing after lunch, you know, I'm going to look at that person's policies and say, you know, how specific did they get in this policy? And are they following the hospital's policy? Because the hospital's policy trumps AORN and Amy, unless it's something in there that's a CMS or Joint Commission, site, you know, rule. So be careful with those. <laughs> Yeah, I think in environmental care and infection control. So uh, poor lighting in there, uh, the lack mm -hmm. of terminal cleaning or documenting that any terminal cleaning is going on. Uh, I went into one place and literally I didn't have to ask if they were terminally cleaning. Um, there was so much dust on the wall, I could write my name on it. And this was in oh. the prep and pack side. So, you know, making sure that your, your filters are being cleaned, that your, your, um, sprinkler systems are being vacuumed out when they're supposed to. If they have dust on them, you'll get written up for an environment of care, O2, O1, O1. The other thing is uh, dirty and rusting equipment. So if you have equipment, it's a wet area in there, but if you have equipment that's rusting, you can't clean rust. And so that's one of the things that Joint Commission and CMS is on right now. Um, the floor repair. So we've had several people and we've gone in as consultants and told them you need to replace the floor. But, you know, floors coming up, you can see the concrete and the concrete's deteriorating underneath because the, the, it's a wet area and they don't, they don't do it. And then they get written up for it. So, you know, it's things like that to look for flooring, rust. Um, so so hold on one second. Order, hold on one second. I just want to dissect everything you said there because you covered a, <laughs> a lot of things that are very poignant. I'm sorry. I cover yeah. a whole lot, but I don't have that much yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. A lot of things that um, a lot of cell person professional look at. So let me just touch on one. Rust. All right. So I have a light um, 
a light source, you know, magnifying light. So that's rusted. Should I take that out? Should I paint over it? What should I do? Because the next one is going to rust anyway. So mm -hmm. what should I do? Should I change my equipment? Every yes. Business? No, you okay. should replace it. When it rusts, right. you should replace it. You can't paint over it. If you paint over it, it's just going to chip. Right. So right. eventually you're going to have chipped flakes coming off of that. Um, you know, a lot of these things, they don't, I mean, they're not, directly you know like your lighted sources and things like right. that they shouldn't be directly over where water is and things like that that it's getting a splash you need that splash zone above you we see a lot of people that have over their wash sinks you know they have pegboards and things in the back or they decide to put a cork board there or you know they have just basic wall stuff that you know that's a splash zone and so it's also a zone that can't be cleaned and so you're going to have bacteria on those walls and you're going to start seeing holes and chips and things like that. So we see that too. Any holes in your walls, uh, you put up non-laminated paper, um, uh, things coming down with your, um, your indicators still in them. That's one of the things they're supposed to, in the OR, they're supposed to be taking those indicators out and passing them off to the, the RN in the room, who that's a two person verification that it's passed in SPD. It's passed all your biologicals and uh, going through your steam. One second, one second, one second. They're coming back. Yeah, I just had to um, drop a bomb on the integrators because you we typically install process and get integrators coming back all the time. Even mm -hmm. loaners go going from facility from to facility with different types of integrators because that, that's a very salient point. Uh, right. We have we have one question here. I wanted to ask. Um, how do techs make technicians make a case for buying new equipment um, when things seem to um, seem to be working? Um, okay, and that's one of the things that I wanted to tell you too. You need to make sure that you document when you go into what you can be cited for. Number one, I think that that people that work in sterile processing need to understand, um, especially your managers and your supervisors, that when they're requesting equipment. They need to be very specific about what they're requesting, why they're requesting it. You know, maybe you've gotten the three quotes if that's up to you to do or, you know, um, or some kind of price range. If you if you know that it's going to cost to fix it and you make your case based on, you know, this is for infection control. This is an infection control issue. Um, cover yourself because when it comes back to you, you made the request. I once went to a hospital that. I mean, literally has had asbestos in sterile processing and they had put a in the floor and it was exposed and they had put a five gallon bucket over the top of it. And so I was like, what is this five gallon bucket? It was asbestos. Well, wow. there's asbestos under there. So, I mean, wow. immediately, you know, we had to report, you know, this is this is not good. So you always, you know, anytime you need equipment, anytime. But when they asked the the former um, director that was there. If we gave you, you know, say $5,000 in the budget this year, what would you spend it on? They didn't come up with $500 worth of things that they needed. So <laughs> they had um, autoclaves from 1956. And we're oh, talking wow. this was in 2011. Oh, so wow. um, ma majority of them were broken. So you always want to just make sure that you make the request about what you need. Anybody in sterile processing really shouldn't have to defend that much about why you need it. It's a process for your your OR director or your SPD director to make that case. But you can't do your job if you do not have the right things. And that's one of the things when I when I'm <laughs> OK, I'm out of the top five now. So <laughs> one of them that I was going to talk to you about is the latest thing is that they have added on leadership findings to this. So the number one question that I'm asked as a surveyor by people is how did CMS and the Joint Commission write me up for multiple things for the same thing multiple times? And that happens all the time. So if you have a problem in SPD, then you're gonna get an environment of care. So say you have poor lighting in there and you can't see to do your job. You can't see to, to if the, if the um, things in the sink are clean or not. Um, or you don't have a bore scope to check the lumens. So if you don't have that, so 
they can write you up for infection control. Like say you don't have the borescope or you don't have a, uh, you bought a new robot, but you don't have the, the uh, ultrasonic cleaner to clean it in. So they're going to write you up for infection control. So one of them is going to be 020101. And that's that the hospital has an infection control plan and is following it. Then they're going to write you up for ICO 20201 that says that your equipment and everything, you have what you need to do your job with instruments. And that that one specifically is for sterilization and high level disinfection. Then they're going to hold write up, you hold up. One second, one second, one second. How do I find these codes? How do I find these codes? These are all joint commission codes. Oh, OK, so go to the yeah. joint commission website. All right. Well, for you to go to the Joint Commission website, though, your facility that you're at has to give you permission. Um, oh. A lot of times they have electronic access and they uh, they pay for so many people to be on it for that year. A lot of times they purchase the book. And so every department should have a Joint Commission book or, it, or if you're AAA HC, uh, if you're an ambulatory surgery center um, and that's who you're using. If you're DNV and that's who you're using anyone that you use for accreditation has a guideline for you to use so and everyone should have a copy every department should have a copy of those guidelines so that you know what the surveyor is surveying you know what they're there for and that's one of the things that we teach a lot a lot to in the operating room and in sterile processing is what the surveyor is surveying and what your role as a as a tech a nurse you know whatever position you're in how it relates to these standards so we do um, boot camps for that you know for uh, people in the leadership position supervisors managers they can send texts and everything like that so that's that's something mm. that we do a lot of um, but they've added to the leadership citations this year so you're going to see a lot of them coming up in 2022 so your leadership means it's not just administrators your leadership is are also the leaders of that department because you're considered a leader. So a lot of times when we see a leadership write up, we think, oh, that's just administration. No, it's every leader of every department and administration. So if you've asked for equipment and you can prove that every year you've said that my, my cart washer doesn't work or one of mm -hmm. my washers is out and they haven't replaced it then it's, it's going to be a leadership. So if I came into your place and I see a work order on something, but it's three months old, I'm going to cite you for that because it's been down for three oh. months. Why has it been down for three months and who hasn't supported you to get that fixed? So, you know, that's, that's unacceptable. So your leaderships are your leadership um, people, teams are going to take a bigger hit in 2022 because we're realizing, which I realized a long time ago, but I think, you know, the government is finally realizing that things aren't being enforced. So leadership is responsible for, for making policies, for making sure that they're updated and they are supposed to be looked at. And some of them must be looked at annually, um, but they have to be looked at. There are some that, that, that have to be looked at annually, but then there are some that, um, only have to be looked at every three years, but every three years that policy has to be updated or it's out of date and you will get cited for that. And then if you're not enforcing it. So we see surgical attire policies. That's one of the biggest things that we see. We, the first thing I want to read before I go into surgery is their surgical attire policy, because I know I'm going to look for it there. I'm going to look for it in the C-section rooms. I'm going to look at it in sterile processing and see if all these people, because when they write that surgical policy, it, it means all of these people who are doing sterile procedures, including cath lab and interventional radiology. So if you're open sterile packs to do sterile procedures, you should be following the surgical attire policy. Um, you know, we go in and we see people with watches on and sterile processing rings on earrings um, that aren't covered. Uh, we see fake eyelashes uh, actually was at a hospital. <laughs> in um outside of washington and the uh, i just was in the operating room one of those rare days um he opened his <laughs> uh tray and his implant tray had um a full eyelash that had peeled off wow. i guess in sterile processing so one of the things that i wow. tell people yes they're you know that's a new thing new fashion thing and fake eyelashes are nice but they're not appropriate for for the work environment with steam and all of that stuff you know glue is going to come and right. so so let me ask you a question based on that 
So can you write a policy around the watches, the nails, and the eyelashes to allow it under you certain bet. under circumstance certain circumstances? If you can get your infection control person to sign off on it, then yes. But that's one thing that you that should always be happening in your policies because it whatever you write in that policy doesn't just affect your department. Uh, surgical attire policy affects, like I said, the OR, uh, labor and delivery, uh, your SPD areas, your cath lab. So all these directors and your infection control person has to sign off on that. The same with all of your cleaners that you're using in your hospital. They have to be on a list of approved cleaners that infection control has approved of. So mm -hmm. if we go through and we see Dawn dishwashing liquid in, uh, you know, in a decontam area, we want to look at, we're going to take that and we're going to look on the hospital's list, list of approved um, disinfectants. And if it's not on that list, we're going to cite you for it. So there is so, so much information that I could give you that I can't mm. give you in just, you know, 45 minutes or an hour. So we'll, we'll make a part, a part two. Okay. So, because <laughs> uh, no, um, our LinkedIn feed had some technical difficulties. So we'll, we definitely want to go live on LinkedIn. So we'll definitely have a part two because you have a, I have a bunch of questions in between I want to ask, but we'll probably go for two hours. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> so I'm letting you go and pick my points to ask you. Um, so main question I wanted to ask you because I've been thinking about this for the last 10 minutes. What's the difference between uh, DMV and um, CMS or Joint Commission? Oh, Okay. This this is very good to know. So every hospital, if you take Medicare or Medicaid, then you have to be CMS certified, which means that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid comes in and they give you a pass and you are able to bill them to for cases of people that come in that have Medicare or Medicaid. And, you know, they make up probably 80 percent, you know, of health care right now. 20% is, you know, your um, private pay and your insured people. So, well, I think that's, that's actually gotten a little bit better now. But if you're in a facility that, it, that is with the CMS, then CMS then uses different, they use the Joint Commission, AAAHC, um, and DNV. Those are the top three that are being used by hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers. They use one of them to come in and do their accreditation. So CMS has given them the okay. If you go in and put a stamp on it and say that they're okay, that they're certified with your hospital, then we will allow them. We'll, we'll give them the check off and they can do Medicare, Medicaid. So when you first open a facility, you're going to get a state and federal walkthrough. And that, that will be the first thing that says you can take Medicare. After that, if you say we're going to be Joint Commission certified, Joint Commission will come in and do a full survey and certify you as uh, underneath them. Then CMS, because it's not large enough to do every hospital and every facility across the country, uh, they'll take maybe 5% of the hospitals. And if you're one of the hospitals that's chosen, you'll have your Joint Commission survey and you'll also have a CMS survey in the same year. I've seen them come back to back. One year Joint Commission mm -hmm. came, the next week CMS came, and the two reports were totally different. So, oh. you know, CMS's was more like 40, 50 pages long and very detailed, and the Joint Commission's was a little bit shorter. So hmm. I'm, I'm one of those people who I, I do, and I'm, I'm just going to say this on your feed, I disagree with the Joint Commission owning Joint Commission resources. I think it's a conflict of interest. We have a lot of facilities that are using uh, Joint Commission resources, and what they're not realizing is that they're giving up that ability to uh, write a lot of their own policies because every time you turn around joint commission now they have their own policies and uh, joint commission resources they just came out with a set of policies and procedures so if every hospital adopts their policies and procedures do you think the joint commission is going to come in and write you up for something so we see people going to those cons and they're they're a consulting firm to come in and get you ready so they have all these tools and, you know, we see people that go to Joint Commission and they, they have the tools, but they're not using them. Or people in, in your department and OR, they don't know that they're available to them. But the other thing is, you know, you just, it, it's a conflict of interest. And it was brought up um, a year ago. It was brought up in 
Congress and President Trump at that time wanted to, you know, he believed it was a conflict of interest, at, at, you know, at the same. And they had several people looking into that. And the ball has been dropped on that. Um, Joint Commission came back with, well, we're a mile down the road and we're kind of separate from them, but they're not separate from them. Do you know? So I don't know. I I, it's frustrating for me because I see a lot of hospitals that, you know, they're not doing the right thing, but I hear from them, well, Joint Commission's never cited us for this. And uh, one hospital um, that I was at this past year, it was absolutely horrible. <laughs> uh, we're talking roaches. Um, we're talking wow. through the washer. They were putting things um, in their cart washer. They were putting rugs from housekeeping wow. through there. They were putting wow. carts from the cafeteria through there to clean. There was dirt, mm. mud, debris in the bottom of the, the washer. And, and, you know, we're just, and there are water bugs and roaches. And we're seeing how, how did you, you just had joint commission? <laughs> how did they pass you? You know, who are you using for your consulting firm? You know, and so that's one of the questions. We have to do things not because someone else tells us we have to do them. We need to be doing things in sterile processing because it's the right thing to do. Um, everything starts with you guys. You're the most important person, in my opinion, in the operating room because the surgeon can't do his job if he doesn't have clean instrumentation. Uh, we end up with surgical site infections, you know, all kinds of things. We're opening trays that still have, you know, uh, blood and bone and things like that in them. Some of it is because, you know, they're not being cleaned. I saw a knee scope um, not long ago that they didn't have a bore scope to check the lumens. And so we ask them, how are you doing it? Well, they hold it up to the light and they, you know, look it through it with one eye to see, you know, if the lumen is clean. Well, this one, actually, we put a, 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 deal, a scope in and put that through it and dirty blood came out on the other side. And I'm like, wow. this is what goes into a patient's knee when you don't check the lumens like you're supposed to. You know, and so I'm, I'm I'm always surprised. I've been talking to a lot of physicians, a lot of surgeons. You know, I think that they need to be made aware a lot of times if things aren't, you know, if they have complaints about things not being cleaned, take a trip down to sterile processing. See what's happening with your instrumentation. You know, um, if you're in administration, go down and ask questions. You know, um, in my experience of building and remodeling hospitals, you know, again, you guys are one of the most, or sterile processing is one of the most crucial areas that you can go to. And it needs to be designed better. If they give you very little space sometimes and you just have to let them know if they don't, how important it is, you know, to start right there and then build your, build your OR around it. If you add on OR rooms and you add on, you know, other endoscopy rooms, you need to also be adding on to sterile processing, not only with staff members, but with equipment. And that's, so we true. see that a lot. You know, they've so. expanded. We, we got, we just got 10 more ORs. So what did you do to SPD? Nothing. True. So, true. you know, true. I'm an advocate for you guys. <laughs> Hold on one second. So um, I have some questions to ask you about the relationship between Joint Commission, CMS, and DMV also. But we'll be right back. We'll take a 30 second break. But first guy. Please go to the YouTube channel, like and subscribe, and also hit that notification bell so you'll be informed every time we have a new show or new content out. We'll be right back. So welcome back, guys. We have Marla Roberts in the house, and she's breaking down. <laughs> she's breaking down the whole process of um, Joint Commission inspections and inspections in general, and what you should look for when going through a survey. Uh, what uh, what Joint Commission is looking for next year, also. So um, definitely tune in, pay attention. If you if you've been listening for the past forty five minutes, um, stay tuned. We have some more information for you. And uh, we're thinking of having a part two because there's so much information here. I don't want to stop you and make you go uh, 
too long, but um, I definitely want, we had a question there from Jesse. Um, what's the relationship between Joint Commission and CMS? Who reports to who, who's above who? It's all idea on a partnership okay. level. Yeah, the, the CMS is the top one, okay? And like an umbrella, they're the, mm-hmm. they're the umbrella. And underneath them, you have the accrediting bodies. So CMS, they're the boss. And under okay. them, they've allowed Joint Commission, DNV, AAAHC. Um, those are the only three I can really think of. Those are the ones I survey for mm-hmm. to look under, to, to go to these hospitals and give them a pass or a fail. If Joint Commission comes into your hospital and they find an immediate jeopardy, um, and one of the top ones is, you know, not being, well, two of the top ones are, you know, that doesn't concern you guys, but, um, dealing with malignant hypothermia, one thing. And then number two is doing things in positive rooms, you know, ha- having the pressures off. So if you're doing a surgery or a sterile processing is not in the right pressure, they can completely stop everything, the survey, and they will. They'll stop it at that time. Say Joint Commission comes in on Monday morning, and they're supposed to be there for three days at your facility. Well, Monday afternoon, they find something that they believe is an immediate threat to someone's life, whether it's a staff member, a patient, a visitor. They can call CMS, let them know what they're finding. They'll stop the survey, call everyone into administration, let the administration of the hospital know what they have found and that they feel like that's an immediate, excuse me, an immediate jeopardy. And at that point, they will call CMS. And someone from CMS will talk to them on the phone and they will either say, go on with the survey or stop the survey, go home, we're coming in. And then you'll see CMS come in. So that's the power that CMS has over Joint Commission, AAAHC, and DNB. Oh, wow. Um, And like I was telling you, the reason why everyone doesn't have a CMS survey every three years or every, you know, whatever, it's just random because they pick maybe 5% of the hospitals across and, and, and across the country to go in and resurvey. So that, that's, that's one of the things I, I really believe that the Joint Commission and CMS should communicate more than they do, but I know that they don't communicate as well as they do. So it's just the luck of the draw if you're going to be one of the people that are in that. Uh, there are also different regions in the area. And uh, one of the toughest ones is Region 8. And Region 8 encompasses those southern states such as like Mississippi, Georgia. um, Let's see what else is around there. Missouri. So some of those that are in Region 8, they get hit a little bit harder. And it's mainly because the CMS director of of that region in there, she's very tough and she's very hard and she wants her surveyors to be so. So in those areas, we always find people written up for more than we do out in California or, uh, you know, up north. So question, Um, Alessandra posed a question here. What if um, I report um, anonymously? What happens? Um, What, what, what do, how do I do it? And what happens after I do it? What's the follow up? Um, you can report anonymous, anonymously. We have, um, there are several hospitals out there that do, you know, internally. It does remain anonymous. Um, the other thing is they can't, uh, there can't be any retribution. So if CMS comes in and says that we have an internal complaint, um, you know, they can't give the name of the person that's making the complaint or anything else. So it's completely anonymous. And if for some reason that person decides to tell someone and then that person tells someone else or, you know, you know how things get out, then, you know, there still can't be any retribution uh, for, the, for, for that person, you know, from administration. What we're seeing today and what's more frightening for administrators is that you do have more self-reporting by facilities because the millennials and the Generation X they're very different than the other people that were just, they're loyal to the hospitals. I mean, you see this not only in hospitals, you just see this across the board. You know, millennials expect more. Uh, they think that, you know, um, this is the way it should be and this is how it's going to be if I'm going to work here. And they're just more aware. You know, I think in my generation, yes, I'm old. 
I think I was raised, you know, just, you know, you follow your leaders. You don't really ask many questions. And, you know, there was a lot of bullying that went on with administrators at that time. You know, when Joint Commission comes, you do this and you do this and you don't say this and never ask me questions. You know, I mean, that was how, you know, I started out in nursing and you were just loyal to your hospital because, you know, I, I also was grew up in a rural, a rural part of the country. And so there weren't many jobs for me to, you know if I, if I wanted to buck the system or say anything, you know, there weren't many other jobs for me to go to, but at the time I didn't know anything about reporting to CMS or joint commission, but, um, you know, that's one of the things with the joint commission, everyone and every patient that comes in has to know how to report and make a complaint. So it has to be posted, um, in the hospital, like when they come in, When they come in, it has to be posted in the ER when patients come in. So everywhere, you know, you'll have patient rights and that's part of your patient rights. It's part of staff rights there uh, for anybody is to protect yourself and, you know, to do what's right. Again, like I said, we don't do everything we do just to make sure that we're passing a standard or whatever. If we I think if we see something that's not being done properly, we should first speak up. And we should go through, you know, our proper channels in administration and give them, you know, the first chance to to hear you out. So if you go to your manager and your manager doesn't hear you out or doesn't do anything, go to your director. If your director doesn't hear you, manage you out. Go to your VP if you have one. If they don't hear you, you know, go up to your next level, go to your CNO, your, you know, your COO and then eventually to your CEO. And, you know, once you because every hospital has a chain of command and, you know, and everybody has a a right for their voice to be heard. So if you're doing um, something out of, you know, for cultural safety or to protect your patients, most definitely I encourage you, you know, first to follow your your chain of command that's in the hospital. But then if if you're not getting results, I mean, we do see the self-reporting going on. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's insightful. Okay, Jesse has a question, and then we, all of us in Stellar Processing know this for a fact. Like, there are some facilities you go to. Travelers, you know, experience it a lot. You go to that facility, and you wonder, how is this facility passing inspections? Yes. Um, <laughs> so, Believe me, I wonder that all the time. <laughs> I tell people, please do not call me if you do not want the truth. I mean, I'm very blunt. I am from Texas. I am going to tell you exactly what's on my mind. Um, You can't sugarcoat things, you know. And so administrators that ask me to come in, they ask me because they want to know the truth. You know, we can't put lipstick on a pig and make it pretty. And um, that's that's not what it's all about. I've been into so many hospitals that I, I... I've looked at their sterile processing department and I I just, I shake my head. I mean, they have a kitchen sink and sterile processing, you know, the lights are horrible. Um, They might be work. I mean, the working conditions, you know, are one of the things that I always look at too. Do you have, you know, floor mats available that, you know, that you can stand on to ease your back pain, you know? So I look at the working environment, you know, from an OSHA standpoint, because I am OSHA certified 10 and 30. So I look at it from the OSHA standpoint, as well as looking at it from the Joint Commission, CMS. Um, But I I do believe, I mean, I do see these hospitals that I I just, I shake my head, you know, I I just have no idea. And I see the patients coming in and I'm like, don't go. (laughs) But that's why we're we're here. I actually have a group of nurses um, that I take with me and we remodel. So we had one... um, not long ago that we went in and we stayed there a couple of months and we worked along. We actually go in and get down and dirty. We put on scrubs, we put on hats, masks, gloves, and we go in and wipe. We clean, we disinfect, we reorganize, and we're educating their staff as we're doing that at the same time. And so while we're doing that alongside their staff, they're getting the Oh, I see that, you know, I had one manager tell me this was really a big slap in my face but I actually am so glad that you came because we needed that wake up call and we're never letting it get bad again. You know, it's, it's easy to go into your house. And if you live in a messy house, you're used to it. You know, you put your blinders on or whatever, but so it's kind of like that when you go to work every day, you put your blinders on and that's, that's your expectation. And then when those blinders are taken off and you, you see, 
oh, wow, if I did, if I put this here or if I didn't do this or if I clean this up, I would have more room. I would have better flow. I would be going from dirty to clean, you know, so, so many things like that. Another one of the things that, that I like to do is in the water sourcing, you know, looking at water sources and go in and take a, take a napkin and put it up in your sink, um, the faucet. And when you pull it out, see if there's any bacteria growing inside of it. And if there is, it'll be, you know, either green or it'll be a slimy um, pink color. So you know that you have bacteria growing in those things. And so it's things like that that people in sterile processing don't look at because they don't think about it. And water quality is one of the things you need to think about. Mm -hmm. And so I, I know we, we're about to have to wrap this up and I'll answer any yeah. questions. But the last thing. I just want to make you aware of is also the fire hazard, you know, that we see in a lot of hospitals. And I've seen a lot of hospitals across the country this past year and last year written up for this. And that's keeping supplies, anyone or um, storing anything behind your autoclaves or your washers. Those are hot zones and that's the repair area for them. And we see um, don't do not let facilities leave ladders in there and, you know, parts and do not store things in those areas because they have to be clean and free. There's again, it's also a fire hazard if they're storing things behind there. Oh, wow. Uh Whoa, that's a lot. That's a lot. So you can't keep a... <laughs> did, you, did you write all this down, Denard? <laughs> I was writing some stuff down. I was like, um, so you can't keep a little step stool back there? A little step no. stool? Oh, damn. Yeah. All right, I got to take that out. You can't um, keep anything. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So, all right. Um, so, uh, Rebecca had a question. Um, should, uh, should the culture change... Um, with the visits um, or, or the stringency of the CMS visits or the, t the Joint Commission on CMS visits? Um, should the culture change around that? Can you see the question? Yes, I was trying to yeah, read yeah. it. Okay. Okay. As our department mindsets and cultures change surrounding the Joint Commission and CMS visits, shouldn't CMS culture change as needed? Well, yes, they should, you know. Um, a lot of times what we what we need to see is the culture change inside of the hospital. You know, um, mm. there was there was a poll on LinkedIn today and it was, you know, why do people leave their jobs? You know, is it culture um, or is it leadership or something else? Well, it's always leadership because leadership is the one that sets the the um, standard that sets the culture in, in the facility. So, you know, if you sure. have one bad apple, it can ruin your whole bunch. And so you do want to try to call that out. You know, you always are going to have your high performers, your medium performers and your low performers. You know, you you probably will end up needing to push along those low performers if you can't bring them up. But you want everyone to be high performers. You want them to take pride in their work. Um, and to do that, it takes a special skill set of leadership. Um, you know, as I said before, I think you should go down and work with your staff. You know, um, as a, a VP of surgery, I would still go into the hospital and put on my scrubs and go and hang out and start processing and ask questions, answer questions, you know, but not just being answering questions, be hands on. Um, one hospital not long ago we were in, we pulled uh, 600 and something pill packs off their shelves because everything was in a closed locked position. And so we had to redo all of wow. them and sterile processing were just like because they're already inundated and it was just a lack of, um, you know, the 3M cards that's supposed to fold down to keep your instrument open. So it was mm -hmm. just a lack of education and training uh, in, in the department. This is how I was told to do it. And so this is how they were doing it. So, so hold I up, think a hold, lot of times you just got to step in and hold, 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 hold up. Sorry. <laughs> now this closed and locked. Okay. Talking about, Ratchet locked or yes. closed? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. All right. All right. All right. Either or. Thought... When your instruments go through the washer and the autoclave, they are supposed to be open. Mm -hmm. And then they have I'm to be about open pill, when you put pill them in the pack pill pack. Now. Pill pack now. Yes. So I, I, I yes. think there was a change. I'm not too sure because you're the expert here. If, it, if your scissors are closed, that's still acceptable. Right? No. Correct. If your scissors oh. are closed, how did you contaminate them on the inside? 
No, it for doesn't. sterilization in a <laughs> pill pack. Did that change? I think I heard that change. I have to, I have to go and re- um, refresh my uh, No, my if notes. it did, please let me know because, no. If you have a set of Mayo or Met scissors All and right. you close them, mm-hmm. how are you sterilizing the inside of those where they're actually doing the cutting? You're not. Okay. I don't want to go. I don't want to go into that now. I don't want to go into that now. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had a bunch of arguments about that. Um, yeah, I just want. I just want to hear your your opinion on that. I'm thinking. Um, we have. Um, That's what you're separating sh- for, Denard. <laughs> yeah. Some people don't have separators, so you know. Anyway, all right. So I digress. Uh, how are the inspectors chosen for the surveys? They're randomly not- chosen if they work for CMS or Joint Commission. Um, one of its availability, usually they know six months in advance their schedule. Um, hmm. So they know when they're flying out and what they're doing and where they're going and, and so on and so forth. But then there are also some that are rerouted. So if there's an immediate threat or something like that or immediate jeopardy, they're rerouted to that hospital right away you know the closest how, person there the person that you know is available and how can someone become a surveyor what's what are the what's the criteria for that um well you're going to have to look on the cms and joint commission website it's just it's having the experience you know having the background um i've actually been offered to work for both for cms and for the joint commission um i don't want to be on that side though uh, I, I would be so tough on people that they probably wouldn't keep me very long. <laughs> but, you know, I would be that person that you don't want to see come into your facility. And, you know, I've had people um, that we do go to and they're just like, oh, man, I would love to come see your house. Well, my house is nothing like, you know, going to somewhere that has to be right. sterile. But, um, you know, it, there's several reasons why. I think being being on my side, I would rather come and tell you what's not right and help you fix it, you know, than just come and tell you, you know, what's not right. This is wrong, you know. So when I do that, I'm able to, um, you know, I have a I have a um, background in English and education as well, and so that education part of me wants to to do that education and to do that teaching and to work alongside people who are just like me you know, to let them know this is, this is how you need to do things. Um, you know, I know I'm bragging about this, but the hospitals where I, I was always a director of VP, I had the lowest patient, I mean, the lowest um, satisfaction rate I had among my employees was 98%. Mm, wow. So it's working alongside them. It's letting them know that, you know, you appreciate them, you know, you're there for them. You're the advocate for them and, you know, vice versa. So Hmm. Very good. Very good. And so we are wrapping up, guys. If someone wanted to contact you, um, how would they go about doing that? I can. You can email me at marla.roberts at periopar.com, which is P-E-R-I-O-P-A-R.com. So because it's periop accreditation readiness. Um, our, our quote in there is, are your facilities up to par? And we like hmm. to come in and see if they are. So you can always do that. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, and, and hold on. Let me give know, you the floor. Let me give you the floor. You talk about your business and talk about how you could provide some services to some facilities who are definitely in need. And if someone wanted to um, recommend you to a facility or their facility, how would they do that also? Um, well, you can always call me. And that, and that number is on my LinkedIn thing, and it's my cell as, as well. So that's 817-307-0415. Um, please don't shoot me text asking me questions, though, because I used to get those all the time. I'm like, no, no, no. Um, the best way to reach me, though, usually is, is sending me a message on LinkedIn or sending me an email. Uh, we have a lot of facilities that, you know, we have, we, we're, we're requested by the OR director. They're so busy. They're trying to do staffing and budgeting and all these other things that, that regulatory walkthroughs and keeping up with guidelines and HR competencies and policies are difficult for them to do. Um, and so we go in and do, you know, we also go in and do a lot of infection control surveys where we're just 
um, focusing not on documentation of anything, just infection control in the operating room, uh, cath lab, um, sterile processing, and uh, like your C-section rooms, things like that. We do an in-depth, you know, four or five day, you know, several people and the only standard, we're looking at infection control. Of course, infection control also bleeds over into environment of care a lot of times. And then, of course, it also leads over into leadership. What has leadership been doing or not doing to help you out? But, you know, we're not hard on, on leadership because we're there for the leaders to help educate them and teach them and get them the things that they need to be successful in their department. Let me take you Excellent, excellent, excellent. And I'll definitely, definitely be contacting you also because <laughs> um, we definitely need to chat. And I, I believe if you agree, we'll definitely have a second show. Um, I'll ask you a couple more. We'll, we'll stop a little more in between so we could focus on a couple of things, be a little more intricate to help those persons who, who have certain issues that want to know exactly how, how do they fix it or if it's actually a, a right. problem within the right. department because. There are those problems that are actual, and there are some things that are per, per, preferred. Some departments would like to. Okay, let me ask you a question. Hot topic before we go. What's your stance on metal brushes? <laughs> I think um, the problem with metal brushes is that number one, we're finding that they're they're scratching some of the instrumentations, or some of the bristles are coming off, and they're being um sent through the washer and some are actually caught in them and they go through the autoclave and they're wrapped that way because they're they're teeny tiny and people aren't using their their lighted magnifiers when they're putting together sets and so you know with the naked eye just one little bristle wire bristle is hard to see with um covid and you know it has so many variants and everything else that's going around now they're looking at should the same solution be used you know for the same patient um, each patient tray, you, you will ask people, when do you change your ultrasonic cleaner? And they'll, they'll say when it's visibly dirty or soiled. And, and no, really, I mean, it should be changed after every patient case that you're doing. Um, the same thing with um, high-level disinfection that's around Sodex now. It's good for 14 days. But so who's going to tell you if you put instruments in there that were used on someone with C. diff, you know? So those have to be bleached and then they have to go into the side X and then leaving them for 14 days. Not, you know, I mean, just with everything going on these days, people aren't doing them. If, if one patient gets an infection and you're using the same water and the same brush and the same everything on the next patient, you know, or the next case cart that you get in, then you're going to pass some of these things along eventually. So, you know, a lot of these things are hand washed, um, some of them are hand washed and they go into the sterad. Um, so it's it's just, you know, what what kills it, you know? And when COVID came out, no one really knew what killed it, what the kill time was, what the contact time was. Um, and so with the variants that are coming out and people coming in and going through surgery, I just think it's always, you know, it's good to be aware because usually SPD, are, they're the last people to know <laughs> that that patient was infectious. True. So it shouldn't so be true. that way. It's true. And we'll leave it off <laughs> at that point. That's all the good Thank information. You. Yeah, I mean, thinking I'll bring that up on some other platforms too. Um, well, thank you so guys, much for having me. I hope I was able to cover <laughs> what you asked. I had this big thing, but I, I really get off topic very easily. <laughs> you you covered so much. I, I think you will have some persons going to the department uh, tomorrow, second guessing some some things. So definitely, all when whoever listens to this in the future, um, thank you guys uh, for tuning in. And um, I know you guys are going to go to your department and uh, second guess a couple of things or just make sure your competencies or your policies are in order. That policy information was very valuable. Um, I'm going to pick your brain on some of that too. Um, okay. So guys, thank you we so much. We do have much. a LinkedIn page that you can follow and it is at Periodic oh, yeah. Foundation Readiness. You can follow us. We haven't been updating that well. Like I said, I've had pneumonia and moved. And so we're going to be getting back out there and just, you know, we post some articles and things like that, but we're not real active, you know, on social Could you media. Mention that, because we're uh, so busy that group field. again? Could you it's, mention that group again? Yes, it's Periop Accreditation Readiness. 
carry up accreditation readiness on LinkedIn. Yes. All right. I'm I'm joining tonight. Thank so, you. <laughs> <laughs> so so guys, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Marla. We really appreciate your time, and we hope to have you back for a second show. Thank um, you for having me. You are welcome. And guys, thank you for tuning in and tune in next week, the same time. Um, and peace. We're out. <laughs>